The final speaker in our panel today will be Dr. Sheena Jocelyn, who is a senior scientist at the Hospital for Sick Children and an associate professor at the University of Toronto. She holds a Canada Research Chair in Molecular and Cellular Cognition. Dr. Jocelyn's work, which has been incredibly seminal in our understanding of learning and memory, is dedicated to understanding the molecular, cellular, and circuit processes underlying how the brain encodes, stores, and uses information. Dr. Jocelyn. Well, thanks very much, Michelle, and um, thanks to the conference organizers. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about our work um, looking at how the brain forms and stores memories. We think that by understanding these very basic processes of how we encode and store information, we can apply what we learn to a variety of human conditions, be it autism or acquired, br acquired brain injury, all the way up to um, Alzheimer's disease. <coughs> So this is a picture for Hugh, who used to be in Toronto, just in case you're missing the Toronto weather. So I've really been inspired by a few luminaries in the field, and this is Carl Lashley. And what Carl Lashley tried to do was to find the area in the brain that was responsible for encoding a, and storing a memory. This is a picture from Carl Lashley in about the 1920s. And in his work, he really tried to find what he called the engram, or that, the memory trace, those neurons, those bits of the brain where a memory is formed and, and held. And in about 30 years of his career, he tried the same experiment over and over again. So what he would do is he would train mice and rats in a maze task, and then try and look for that part in the brain where this memory was stored. So he would go in and lesion out different bits of the cortex in order to try and find where this um, memory was stored. So his findings for this sort of 30-year odyssey can be explained in this graph, where he showed that a memory deficit was correlated with the amount of cortex he removed, but had nothing to do with the place that he removed this cortex. So he couldn't ever find the memory trace. It was everywhere in the cortex, but nowhere at all. And he summed it up in a, a lovely quote in the 1950s, where he says that this series of experiments has yielded a good bit of information about where and when, where about what and where the memory trace is not. It has discovered nothing directly of the real nature of the engram. I sometimes feel in reviewing the evidence on the localization of the memory trace that the necessary conclusion is that learning just is not possible. <laughs> it is difficult to conceive of a mechanism which can satisfy the conditions set for it. None, nevertheless, in spite of such evidence against it, learning does sometimes occur. And, and I kind of like that. It sort of ended on an upbeat. So in my lab, we're trying to do the same sort of thing. We're trying to find where in the brain a memory is localized, or the engram. But in our studies, we're not going to use this very complex spatial task. Instead, we're going to use a very easy task, which is called auditory fear conditioning. So this is very much like Pavlov's dogs. And what we do is we take a mouse, we put him in a unique chamber, and we pair a single tone with a single foot shock. Not enough to hurt the animal, just enough so the animal goes, <gasps> what the? And then we try and look later to see where the memory is. So we have to find out, OK, is the mouse afraid? And it's very easy to ask a human if they're afraid. You can just look at them, and you can see this man is afraid in, in the one that he looks afraid in. We do the same thing in mice. And it's really tricky. <laughs> you have to have a PhD in psychology to know that this is actually the fearful mouse. So we have to define and decide new ways of asking the mouse, are you afraid? So we look at what the mouse normally does. And when the mouse normally is afraid, they adopt this crouched, motionless posture that we call freezing. And what we do is we just measure the amount of time that an animal spell spends freezing to the tone, and we use that as our index of a fear memory. So it's a very easy way of quantifying how afraid a mouse is. So in our tests, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to look in a particular brain region called the lateral amygdala. And this is an ear-to-ear, -ear, so a coronal section of a mouse brain. And we're going to look in this area right here called the lateral amygdala, because we're building on findings from a lot of previous work showing that this area is really important for fear. But what's also very cool is that a lot of research has shown that even though there are thousands of neurons in the lateral amygdala, a very small portion of neurons, less than 20%, are those that are actually necessary for encoding any one fear memory. So you have many, many neurons in this one brain region. A very small percentage are needed to encode any one fear memory. 
And the people in my lab asked first, why is it that this one neuron, this red neuron, is involved in this fear memory where its neighboring neuron is not? So we started a series of studies to try and look at this. So what we ended up um, concluding was that eligible lateral amygdala neurons seem to compete against one another for recruitment or allocation to a fear engram or a fear memory network. Now, we've already heard a little bit about competition between neurons in the developing brain, but this is competition for neurons during learning. So what we did is we um, manipulated levels of this transcription factor called CREB. And the details aren't important. Just know that CREB is a really nodal point in a larger um, memory network. So what we did in these experiments is we took a replication defect of herpes simplex viral vector. So we took a herpes virus, we took out everything that made it herpes, and instead made it overexpress CREB. And we like herpes because we call it the Sir mix a lot of uh, viruses, because it likes big neurons. So when we inject this into the brain of mice, we infect only really big excitatory neurons in the lateral amygdala. So we're going to increase levels of CREB, and we're going to have a marker, a GFP, a, a green fluorescent protein, to mark the neurons that we've infected. And then we're going to look at first memory. So we're going to see how much the mouse spends freezing to the tone. And then we're going to try and look at the engram. So we're going to try and find the neurons that are active following memory recall and see what happens when we manipulate different CREB levels in different neuronal populations. And the way we look at um, activity in a neuron is we use an activity marker. It's an immediate early gene called ARC. A neuron that is recently active is going to have ARC localized to the nucleus. So we're going to check mice after they recall this fear memory. We're going to look for neurons that are active. And this is, we think, a proxy for our engram for this fear memory. So when we do this, so we're going to increase CREB in a small percentage of these lateral amygdala neurons, then test their memory. And as you can see here, mice that have increased levels of CREB in this very small, random population of LA neurons show greater freezing to the tone, so they have better fear memory. And then we looked at which neurons are active, or tried to get a proxy for which neurons are part of this engram. We found that neurons with these increased levels of CREB were more likely than their non-infected um, neighbors to be positive for ARC. So they're more likely to be part of this um, engram. So from this, we can say, OK, that's pretty good correlative evidence that neurons with increased levels of CREB are important in, this, um, in the fear engram. But what we really want to do is just target just these neurons overexpressing CREB after something's been learned and see what happens to the memory. We think this is really the sort of experiment that Lashley was trying to get at. So in this experiment, we did exactly the same thing as before. So we're going to overexpress CREB in a small population of neurons. We're going to train mice. We're going to test mice. But then after we test them, we're going to do a genetic trick, which allows us to kill just these neurons that are overexpressing CREB. And we're going to test the memory again. So we're going to test them a second time after just these small portion of neurons overexpressing CREB are killed and see what happens to the memory. And as you can see here, now the animals spend much less time freezing to the tone than before. So we think that this suggests that uh, these neurons overexpressing CREB are really important in the expression of this fear memory. So this is Asim Rashid and Chen Yang, two students in my lab. And they said to me, Sheena, killing cells is so 2006. You got to get with the times, use some, mo some modern molecular techniques. So we tried to do that. So the first thing we tried to use is something called a DRED. And that's a designer receptor exclusively activated by a designer drug. So what it is is an artificial receptor, which is no longer active by a ligand and that it occurs naturally, but now is active by um, a made um, of a synthetic ligand. So in this system, which is developed by uh, Brian Ross Lab, they, these dreads come in different flavors. So we're first going to use an inhibitory dread. So when we add CNO, which by itself has no activity, um, when we add it to this receptor, we can hyperpolarize a neuron. So basically, we're going to turn down the volume of a neuron anytime we want to in an experiment. So in this experiment, we're going to do exactly the same thing as before, but instead of killing a neuron, after we test, after we train the animal, we're just going to turn down the activity of these neurons overexpressing CREB right before a memory test. So we're not going to permanently change them. We're just going to turn down their activity and see what happens to memory. And when we do that, lo and behold, when we overexpress um, CREB in a small population of neurons, but then turn down their expression just before a memory test, we see um, a memory deficit, as you can see in the blue bars. 
If we do the same thing to a, a random population of neurons that aren't overexpressing CREB, we see nothing. So it suggests again to us that overexpressing CREB, these neurons that are overexpressing CREB, are really important in the fear memory. But when we do this, we give animals a simple IP injection of CNO, this inert drug, and we give it to them an hour and a half, usually, before our memory test. And this is a long time. What we really want to do is try to get exactly when activity is important in these neurons. So this is Bamberg, Boyden, Dyseroth, Hageman, Miesenbach, and Nagel. And together, they won the 2013 um, Brain Prize for the invention and refinement of optogenetics. And I was fortunate enough to be invited to one of these Brain Prize conferences. And as I was preparing for it, I kept looking at this picture and thinking, geez, it really reminds me of something. Yes. <laughs> the optogenetic bunch. So now we're going to take advantage of the tools provided by the optogenetic bunch to really try and get at wh whether these neurons overexpressing CREB are important in the memory. So in this experiment, we're going to take advantage of um, a light-activated uh, chloride pump. So when we shine a light on halorhodopsin, we get an influx of chloride ions, which again is going to hyperpolarize a neuron. So turn down the activity or turn down the volume of just these neurons just when we shine a light. And the cool thing is now in this experiment, we can test the mouse in the same test session. When these neurons are inactivated, wait a while, test them again with normal activity, see what happens to the memory. And when we do this, we see this lovely result. So we, we inactivate just these neurons overexpressing CREB in one test session, wait five minutes, test them again, the memory comes back. So we see impaired memory when we inhibit the neurons, we wait, and the memory comes back. This is only true in those neurons which were overexpressing CREB at the time of training. Shining a light and all the other control conditions don't do anything. So we're very excited about that. And from this, we are going to conclude that lateral amygdala neurons overexpressing CREB are necessary for the expression of this fear memory. So this is my daughter, Charlotte, and she's wearing the lab t-shirt. And uh, the, she's asking, but what is it about these CREB overexpressing cells that makes them so darn special? Why are they always the ones that are part of the memory trace? So this is Adelaide Yu and Valentina Mercaldo, two postdocs in my lab. And they asked, what is it about CREB that makes them, these cells so um, special? And CREB does a very many things. So the one thing that they thought might be important was increasing neuronal excitability. So if CREB cells, if cells overexpressing CREB are important in a memory trace because they're more excitable, can we replicate this effect by simply targeting neuronal excitability without directly affecting CREB? So to do this, we used another flavor of a DRED, which now is going to increase activity in a cell, so it's going to induce depolarization when we give the drug systemically. And we're going to do the exact same experiment. So now we're not going to manipulate CREB levels at all. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to insert this artificial receptor, and then right before training, well, an hour before training, we're going to give animals a systemic injection of CNO to activate just a small percentage of cells, see what happens to memory. When we do that, we see an increase in um, freezing to the tone, so an increase in the fear memory, just like when we overexpressed CREB for a few days. So just increasing excitability, small population of neurons right before training is enough to um, give us enhanced memory. If we do the same thing, but now give the CNO after training, so we're going to excite these neurons after the animal's been trained rather than before, we see no effect at all. So we have to see an increase in activity before training in order to see this memory enhancement. So then we went to, well, what, how close a time can we get this increase in activity? So when we do the CNO again, we give it an hour before. Can we do this with um, optogenetics? What happens if we activate a cell just in the seconds before we do the training? Do we see memory enhancement? And the answer is yes. So when we shine a light on channel rhodopsin, the type of optogenetic that increases excitability, um, just before training, we see an enhancement in memory. So we think this is fairly good evidence that these lateral amygdala neurons are allocated to an engram based on the relative excitability at the time of training. So in our search for the engram, we've been using a lot of fear conditioning. But it's been said of heroin, and probably also applies to other drugs of abuse, that it's so good, don't even try it once, suggesting that experience with a drug of abuse can form, make a very long-lasting memory that can continue to guide behavior even after you've stopped taking the drug. 
This is actress Lindsay Lohan in the first of her several mugshots. So in 2007, she was arrested for driving under the influence of cocaine. And this one lone experience with cocaine was enough to drive fairly bad behavior for several years. This is Liz Huang. And for her crimes, she is convicted and sentenced to being a graduate student in my lab. And she said, well, if we can find what's going on with the sort of cocaine memory engram, maybe I can manipulate it just like we did with the fear engram and help young actresses such as Lindsay <laughs> or local Toronto politicians. <laughs> so what Liz wanted to do was to do a behavioral task very similar to our fear conditioning where we can ask the animal, do you have a memory of this experience with cocaine? And so for this, we used a very simple um, paradigm called a place preference. As you can see, it's a two-sided box. In one side, animals get cocaine. In another side, they get saline. We test them drug-free. We pull out the, the door in between, and we say, where do you like to spend your time? Animals that have learned to remember that one side was paired with cocaine tend to spend more time there. So Liz did the same sort of experiments as we did with the fear conditioning. First, she overexpressed CREB in a small portion of cells, and she found it enhanced cocaine memory. She found that these cells were more active. She found that she could delete this cocaine memory if she just targeted and ablated these cells after training, and she could also turn down the volume of these cells right before training and get a similar effect. So this suggested to us that very much like a fear Engram, a cocaine engram was also based on this neuronal competition in lateral amygdala neurons. So this suggests there's a lot of similarities, as I mentioned, between learning a cue in a shock and a cue in a cocaine, that lateral amygdala neurons are chosen for incorporation into an engram based on their relative excitability and Krebs function around the times of training. So in our quest to find the engram, which was Carl Lashley's original quest, we've been looking in the lateral amygdala but we appreciate that the lateral amygdala is only a small part of a much larger brain. What we really want to do is to look brain-wide and see where in the brain are cells active so we can try and really map where this memory is stored and see what happens when we manipulate various portions of this um, engram. But the mouse brain is very complex, and it's very hard to see everything in one go. So what we want to do is develop techniques or borrow techniques that other people have developed to try and look at an entire brain all at once. This is singer Mariah Carey. And in a 2009 song, she's, she sang that, I can see you right through you like you're breathing in Windex. Now, perhaps this inspired a new generation of tissue clearing techniques. So these techniques have been used um, to get a brain so that you can see right through it like it's bathing in Windex. So we're going to try and use these techniques to look at where our engram is in the brain. And all of these different techniques have different advantages and disadvantages. They all have very clever names, but the one we're going to use is called Clarity. And this is a picture of uh, Carl Dysroth, also known as Michelle Michelle's husband, but also a very good scientist in his own right. And he developed a tissue clearing technique where he replaced the lipids of a brain with a clear hydrogel. So this is a lovely picture of um, Carl Dyseroth with a normally perfused brain and a clarity perfused brain over his nose. And as you can see, you can actually see right through the brain. So we're going to use this technique to try and find out where in the brain is this memory trace. So this is... Um, uh, Jonathan Epp and Yasuke Noburo, two postdocs in my husband's lab, and this is them celebrating this lovely achievement of putting a brain on Carl Dysroth's face. So I'm going to tell you a little story of how we got a little bit um, misdirected in our, in our strategy. So we started clearing other tissues. We thought the power of this technique was so cool, we started clearing a spleen. And then we started clearing um, mouse kidney. And you can look at the vasculature, and you can actually see an entire kidney under the microscope in 3D. It's so cool. We can make very cool fly-through videos. This is a mouse lung. And you can fly through it because you can see the entire lung. It's so cool. You can see everything. You can stain the tissue after it's been cleared. Again, we got distracted. We started looking at mouse skin. Here is a little bit of um, mouse skin. The green is GFP, marking a hair follicle. The red is a nerve that's been stained with uh, TD tomato. 
We can look at a mouse intestine. Again, we got very distracted looking at many, many different organs. Here is another example of a mouse intestine. This is looking at new um, cells in the mouse by KI67. Again, we got very distracted. And I'm not going to tell you what this is. You can guess. And here's the clue. Studies show that if I had another one of these, I'd have a much bigger lab. <laughs> so here's what we really wanted to do. What we really wanted to do was to try and look in the amygdala and then the entire brain to find the memory trace. And this is not the memory trace, but these are cells that are overexpressing Krebs. So now we can get a very big chunk, this is a millimeter big, trying to find where this memory is, how these cells relate to each other, how they relate to the rest of the brain. We're still in the beginning stages of this, but we think it's a really exciting time for neuroscience. So in my uh, talk today, I'm gonna, it's really a tale of two Carls, how we can now start to answer really important age-old questions by combining very solid, important questions with more modern techniques. So with that, I'd just like to thank everybody in my lab who did the work and uh, to uh, show you this is um, the results of our lab selfie day. So um, April 24th last year at 10.30 a.m., everybody had to take a picture of what they were doing. So this is the lab minus a few conscientious objectors who feel that the selfie is the death of photography. Um, <laughs> I'd like to also acknowledge my husband and... Um, and co-scientist on this, Paul Franklin, Carl Dysrauss, Michelle's husband, and a very good sport about the pictures and my funding agencies. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>